everyone. Thank you for coming out. Um, I'm Kyle Cleveland with TUJ's Institute of Contemporary Asian Studies. This evening we have Noriko Manabe, who has written a recent book entitled The Revolution Will Not Be Televised, Protest Music After Fukushima. I've known Noriko and her work for a number of years, uh, originally dealing with rap or hip-hop music in Japan. And I've always found her work is really closely studied ethnographic work that's based upon her, I think, really deep personal knowledge of music, but also dealing with DJs and these performers at a personal level. And then in this book, connecting that to public spaces and the Fukushima nuclear crisis and uh, civil society. I think uh, music and uh, political activists associated with that have actually been very influential during the anti-nuclear protest. So this evening, she will speak about this for about 40 minutes or so, and then we'll have an extended Q&A. So let's please welcome one of the, one of the Um, thank you, everybody, for coming out. Um, I'm, I'm very grateful to Kyle for setting everything up. It's really great, and all the staff at uh, TUJ who are wonderfully, wonderfully efficient and uh, very pl and uh, friendly. So I'm, I'm very, very happy to be here and to be here at uh, Temple University, which I just joined uh, in Philadelphia. So um, this is what my book looks like. Um, that is the QR code, uh, you know, if you are going to be buying on the U.S. site. And uh, this is the discount code uh, for the U.S. site, which will give you a 30% discount. And I can assure you at $19 for a 460-page book, you know, the price per page is a real bargain. Um, <laughs> so I'm really recommending it from a value standpoint. Okay, so um, a lot of people ask me how I came to this topic, and as Carl was mentioning, um, I have spent uh, a number of years uh, since the mid-2000s uh, looking at club musics in Japan, particularly reggae, where I got to know Ranking Taxi, and then I had met with ECD and Kate Up Shine. And, um, and so I had come to Japan in late 2011 to 2012, to write uh, a book about club music, and I met with these fellows, and they told me about what was going on in the movement, and I thought, oh, oh, well, that sounds kind of urgent. And then this happened. Um, as many of you know, this is what um, the area around the Diet and the uh, Prime Minister's office looked like in much of June, July, and August of 2012. Um, at its peak, the protests had perhaps about 200,000 people, and uh, it's still continuing every week. Um, last weekend, there were about 3,000 people at the protest. So it's the biggest movement since the anti-U.S. security movement or the ANPO movement of the 1960s, which is significant in a country where protests have had this very negative uh, reputation. So I asked myself, well, how did we even get to this point? How does a country that has gone through Hiroshima and Nagasaki and Lucky Dragon 5 end up with 54 nuclear reactors of which only one is not on a fault line? And um, so my book starts out by looking at um, the structures of feeling and the um, political economy that supports nuclear power and uh, what obstacles to um, speaking one's mind and uh, to civic action, there happens to be in Japan. Um, this is not unique to Japan. Um, I know a number of uh, scholars who have worked on nuclear power in India and other countries, and the political economy tends to be very strong in uh, each of these countries. So it's not a unique situation, it's just that it happens to be in our face because of Fukushima. And then um, so I explained the background to the structures that are in place to, to, um, uh, to, pre to prevent free expression of, of opinion. And then I actually go through the so-called spaces of protest, the spaces of, of protest performance where musicians and citizens get together to, to try to oppose nuclear power and to express through music uh, what they actually think and try to rile and mobilize other people into action. Uh, those four spaces that I looked at are cyberspace, demonstrations, festivals, and recordings. 
Now, here I'm looking at spaces as kind of a social construct, and they could also be a mental construct. Um, David Harvey and other scholars have you know, talked about various different um, constructs of spaces. And um, what I'm doing in each space is to think about what are the constraints to free speech or to free expression in each of these spaces? How are these spaces constructed in a way that, that, um, th that constructs barriers to free expression? And how do musicians either ignore them, overrun them, or deal with them to, to express themselves? That's the, that's the main question that I'm asking. So um, most of you here are very aware of the narrative that has developed post Fukushima about what actually happened. And uh, the prevailing narrative tends to be about the Negro Village, where you have five pillars, which are the electric power industry, um, the central government, uh, primarily the bureaucracy, local government, academics, and media, who all trade human beings, people, and uh, money amongst these, which creates kind of a close-knit and um, a close-knit group of people who are very heavily incentivized to continue to have nuclear power. Um, I just want to focus on the media for a second. Um, this graph shows that in the year, uh, in the fiscal year when Fukushima happened, um, mm -hmm. the electric power companies and their associations, and remember at the time electric power companies were regional monopolies, we're spending three times more than Panasonic and four times more than Toyota in Japan on advertising. And well, you think, well, you know, Toyota competes against Honda and Mazda and Nissan and a number of other companies and has new products that they have to sell. Um, if you're a regional monopoly, and I would strain to think of what a new electric power product looked like, then what were they actually advertising? Well. Most of this advertising was PR, and a lot of it had to do with nuclear power. And they were framing nuclear power as being necessary for the economy, environmentally friendly, and absolutely safe. Um, this particular commercial was filmed at Fukushima Daiichi. And um, another thing that's quite interesting about these commercials is there are, there are an awful lot of women in them because women were the most likely people to be opposing nuclear power because of concerns about children and their health. And this was, of course, part of a broader situation that included school contests for the best pro-nuclear signs and cartoons that, you know, like um, you know, Astro Boy that involved nuclear power as part of their, their, their bodies and so on and so forth that naturalized nuclear power in Japan. And, um, and so because this structure of feeling that had been constructed where you thought that to A, um, you will never have a nuclear accident, that it was, it was absolutely safe, and because um, you thought that uh, everything was going to be hunky-dory um, when the nuclear accident actually happened, you actually had um, two um, responses. One was disbelief, and uh, you had TEPCO trying to talk things down. You had the government reflecting what TEPCO was saying, trying to talk things down. Chief Cabinet Secretary Erno kept saying no immediate impact on health seven times while you know, number one blew up and number three blew up and, you know, and, uh, and all these rising radiation figures came out. And then you had the academics coming out saying everything was hunky-dory, like Professor Yamashita, who was the health risk advisor to Fukushima Prefecture, saying that if you smile, you won't be hurt by radiation. And he said that on TV. Right. So, um, and then the other thing about advertising is that a lot of the advertising was concentrated uh, in television. And television is very important for two reasons. One is that over 50% of the population say they rely on television for the news. So if it's not on television, it's not happening. And the second thing is that um, television is a very important part of exposure to musicians. So here's a chart from the Record Industry Association of Japan that shows that TV is the, the biggest way for music to be introduced to the public. So that means that entertainers, and you know, including musicians, are rather reluctant to say anything bad about nuclear power. So when the accident happened, you tended to have kind of an underrepresentation of anti-nuclear positions on TV networks. And in particular, in the news, 
Um, things like demonstrations were often not broadcast, even if they took place right in front of the press club or NHK offices. And so um, many anti-Negro protests have, in fact, been uncovered. And when entertainers um, do speak up, they tend to be punished really badly. So um, here's an example that involved a musician. Um, how many of you guys know Sakamoto Ryuichi? Yellow Magic Orchestra, um, you know, Academy Award-winning uh, composer. Um, he, is, uh, he has been quite active in, in environmental and anti-nuclear movements. So he came to speak at, um, um, at a large protest in July 2012 that took place in Yogi Park that attracted about 170,000 people. And in it, he said, it's only electricity, or taradenki, so to speak. We shouldn't expose to danger this beautiful Japan where lives as children just for the sake of electricity. Life is more important than the economy. Let's protect the children. Let's protect the land of Japan. Now, obviously, he's, he's saying, he's not necessarily saying electricity is bad. He's just saying, let's find another way to make electricity. But what happens is that the pro or Twitter users pick out its only electricity and repeat it out of context, ad infinitum, uh, claiming that Sakamoto was saying electricity wasn't necessary. So it sparks this barrage of binding criticism. You get snarky Twitter comments saying that uh, Sakamoto first catapulted to fame as a member of a technopop group, and you know he should be playing Unplugged from now on. And then photos of Sakamoto with his iPhone and his uh, microphone in circles start to appear on the internet. And the whole thing gets legitimized when the Sankei Chimbun, which is one of the um, national newspapers, prints a front page uh, editorial making fun of Sakamoto. It says, what must you do to be a stylish person of culture these days? Having become popular by using lots of electricity, you live in a high-end condominium in New York. You're not even one of us. You stand at the head of a trending anti-nuclear demonstration and give inflammatory speeches to great applause. Sure, it's the business of artists to attract attention, but all fans hope that you pay a bit more attention to your primary specialty. And uh, so, so this actually legitimizes all the trolling that's been going on against Sakamoto. And um, you know, soon afterwards, a number of, of um, magazines that are aimed toward the salaryman market come out with negative um, comments about negative articles and even, even uh, cover page articles um, against Sakamoto. So that kind of public shaming is quite different from the usual kind of uh, treatment that uh, musicians often get in the US and the UK, unless you're the Dixie Chicks. And um, you know, so you know, if you think of Bono or Bob Geldof, they meet with Tony Blair when he had power, and um, you know, they're, they're lauded for all their activism and so on and so forth. And, you know, and recently at Glastonbury, we had Damon Auburn and a number of other musicians ranting about Brexit. Whereas you know, for Fuji Rock that's coming up, there's been a hashtag tr um, created called um, Let's Keep Politics Out of Music that's been circulating. Why? Because SEALs member Okuda Aki is going to be appearing at the Atomic Cafe, which is an explicitly political corner of this vast music festival. So, so that's the kind of contrast we're, we're, we're talking about. And you know, my, my question is, in this kind of environment, when even the biggest stars could be sanctions for their political views, then how does a musician actually contribute to the movement? Well, there are a couple of things they do. Um, after 3.11, an atmosphere of silence fell over Japan as citizens practiced jishuku, or self-restraint. And those of you who were here at that time know that you kind of couldn't go out, you couldn't have fun, you couldn't even go out and see the cherry blossoms. All these signs um, went up around the cherry blossom viewing area saying that um, you should have respect for the people who are suffering in Tohoku and for the people who died and, um, and restrain yourself from having fun this year. And, um, and uh, radiation actually became a taboo topic. Even in mother circles, people weren't talking about it. So, so this was an example of what's often called the spiral of silence, where you have a minority or an opposing view or an unsanctioned view, so you don't say it. And the more you don't say it, or the more people like you don't say it, then it seems to be even smaller and smaller and smaller a minority until it really does become a taboo topic and nobody talks about it anymore. 
Well, cyberspace can actually be quite good. In, um, uh, in Japan, it tends to be anonymous. Um, there's a much bigger preference for anonymity on the Japanese internet than um, most other places uh, in the world. And um, you know, if you think about what really triggers people into action, um, uh, as um, Manuel Castell says, you know, trigger is, the trigger is anger and the repressor is fear. And once you can get enough anger out there so that you're emboldened to overcome the fear and do something about it and speak up, then you, know, then you really have a movement. And uh, that's basically the kind of affective response that uh, music often has, particularly on the internet where people can actually watch it in private. So in April of 2011, just about a month after the crisis, you had this video appearing on YouTube and notice that the singer-songwriter is trying to disguise himself. He's wearing a hat, and he's wearing sunglasses, and he sang this song. <laughs> Now this video was an instant viral hit, thanks partly to the familiarity of the original song, which had received constant TV play as a theme song for this Shiseido commercial, which you know, he had rewritten as his anti-nuclear song. And so the song captivated many listeners because its direct words spoke straight to what they were actually thinking but could not say. And you know, because at that time you couldn't really say all these things about nuclear power and they weren't really talked about. On, on the media so much. And, uh, and, and also, he sang them with palpable anger, so when he's singing things like 54 reactors, he's, he's really at the very top of his range, so it actually sounds like he's screaming. And, and so this stimulated an affective way waiting to happen, and three days after it appeared on YouTube, uh, protesters sang along to the, a recording of the song at the uh, Koenji demonstration um, that uh, attracted 15,000 people. And as listeners commented, I couldn't understand the news reports, but when I see everyone else singing along, I realize we are all having similar thoughts. So cyberspace not only allows people like Saito Kazuyoshi to release a song, which his record uh, company um, declined to release, it also allows um, uh, musicians to use the internet to actually educate people by bringing up some of the issues and packaging them in a way that is very humorous and, and um, um, stands up to repeat of viewing. So an example of this is ranking taxis. You can't see it, you can't smell it either. Um, and by the way, all these, uh, all these videos and uh, songs are up on the uh, companion website for this, uh, for this book. So when he sings the sweet, optimistic images of the media, we see a heartwarming scene of a mother and child which is an archetypal image in power company commercials, and this idyllic image segues to this kind of eerie X-ray-like color reversal. And we keep seeing these color reversals between black on white, white on black, which suggests that what you're actually hearing is not really true. So let me play that for you. 
ジで客水漏れても安全な原発24時間世界平和を守る原爆3時が起きるまで懲りない性格用心してても起きるマルケラ単純ミス上手な宣伝メディアの威力甘い雰囲気狙いはサブリミナル加熱で新聞ぶち抜き広告信じてるうちに風が吹いてくる放射の強い放射の偉い誰も差別しない誰にも負けない放射の怖い放射のヤバい見えないにおわない誰も逃げられない例えば And we talked about the prevalence of anonymity on the Japanese internet. So let me move on to the next phase, which is demonstrations. So thousands of demonstrations have taken place since 2011, and music is a large part of these demonstrations. You've got、um, DJs and rappers, you've got drummers, you've got punk bands on top of trucks, and you have Jintaro Munta, the Chindam band, that is in many,、um, many, many、uh, demonstrations. And、uh, what I consider In, in thinking about demonstrations, is、um, how do they react to urban space? How does urban space help a demonstration or constrain a demonstration? And the second thing I think about is how does practice evolve over time depending on the political circumstances? So let me first talk about urban space.、Um, a number of urban study scholars have talked about the different elements of a cityscape, which helped me to think about. You know, what are the aspects of a cityscape that, that、uh, hinders or helps a performance? And these include pathways on which people walk, boundaries, intersections,、uh, entry and exit points, and props or landmarks. So、um, let me just talk, of, talk through a few of these.、Um, the district or the place is very important.、Uh, many protests around the world tend to take place in front of decision makers. So, when we think about iconic demonstrations in the United States, they often take place at the Washington Mall, which is a fabulous place to have a demonstration. It leads up to the Capitol, it's, it's humongous, there are lots of opportunities for nice aerial shots.、Um, and, and so, you have you know, big demonstrations for civil rights movements and the anti Vietnam War movements、um, at、uh, the Washington Mall. But Japan's equivalent of that would be the space around the national diet. But the space around there, if any of you guys have been there, is really pretty constrained. And not only is it pretty small and constrained, the police often force you not to use this big road that is often empty that goes up to the diet. They force you to be on the sidewalk. And、uh, they force you to be on the sidewalk by blocking your, your pathway. By having lots and lots of trucks with running, you know, which are kept running, so there's all these fumes that make you want to stay away from them.、Um, then they put, put up a barricade, and then they have policemen standing like this. So、um, it, it,、uh, it does keep you from going out into the road. And you know, I was at one of these demonstration, SEALs demonstrations last year when they were taking place every week. And、um, I think the night I went, there were about 70,000 people trapped on these sidewalks. And that's a lot of people to put on one block in a sidewalk. It was really, really cramped. You could smell everybody around you. Yeah, not to mention smell the fumes. So、um, that, that's a very, very big kind of constraining factor. And also note that there are lots of trees that shade the view, so you can't really get a good aerial picture. Uh, the police also act as a human boundary at demonstrations because they'll usually surround a demonstration both front and back and on the side. And, you know, and boundaries have real meaning in, a, in an urban context because they often mark the boundary, say, between a good neighborhood and a bad neighborhood, so to speak. And so they structure how people behave. So,、um, you know, so, so these are things that、um, organizers have to keep in mind.、Um, Typically, what organizers try to do is to, to maximize the number of intersections. Why? Because intersections are really dramatic places in a,、um, in a city for, for two reasons. One is that you are most visible at, a, at an intersection because you can see this way and that way and any other way that the street opens up, and you are audible in all those directions. Typically, you will hear a demonstration before you actually see it. And so intersections are quite powerful that way. The other way that intersections are, are quite powerful is that they bring people into close contact because 
people, you know, if you're walking this way with the demonstration, then other people are going to be walking this way. And it kind of puts you into the so-called intimate space. You know, there is, there is a theory that says if you're closer to somebody, then you feel more intimate or close to them simply because of the proximity. And, and so intersections become very important for this, uh, for, for, for this reason. And so you often will see uh, protesters actually play to the crowd at intersections, particularly if the stoplight actually traps the, um, uh, the, uh, the so-called audience members or onlookers into looking at you. So, so it's a great place for protest performance. Um, and so often you'll find uh, the performers in a demonstration do very dramatic things too. So, so here's an example of something that happened in the Koenji demonstration in April 2011. Uh, DJ Mayuri, who is a well-known DJ who spent uh, quite a bit of her life in London, uh, is playing Joyce Bourne's incident. And when the truck reaches the, what she does is she takes out the bass and the drums from the mix, and then when she gets to the loudest point in the middle of the intersection, she puts them back in. And people, you know, react in the same way that they would do at a club. You know, when the bass comes back in, the drums comes back in, they get excited and they go, yay! And, and somebody says, gem patsi yamero. And then slowly somebody else says, gem patsi yamero. And it just sort of spreads throughout the entire crowd. And then, uh, because it's an intersection, there is a pedestrian walkway um, above. And uh, there's a crowd watching uh, the protest there, and the protesters start to aim their their uh, performance of Genpa's Yamano at that particular bridge. So it's a, it becomes kind of an iconic moment uh, in this particular demonstration that has an impact on how things develop um, further on. <laughs> Um, that's actually a very interesting point in the demonstration because um, so-called sound demos, which is a word that was coined in 2003 uh, in demonstrations that Sharon Hayashi has uh, written about, um, but they actually kind of existed before them because the idea of having a truck and having some music in a procession that may have um, political implications actually dates, you know, well, certainly in London they were taking place a lot uh, longer before, but in Japan you had the um, um, LGBT parades that were taking place in the 1990s that had these kinds of trucks. And then um, in the, in the uh, sound trucks of 2003, um, a lot of the you know a lot of the um, ethos of those demonstrations happened to be to try to reclaim the streets. So much of the music happened to be techno or house to which people danced, or they were noise, and there were often people moshing in the crowd and so on and so forth. And so that kind of music really fit that particular purpose at the time. Um, when you move to anti-nuclear demonstrations in 2011, um, the first kind of music that really caught on were more rapping kind of musics like reggae and, uh, as you see, uh, Ranking Taxi over here, and uh, rapping by Rumi and ECD and other rappers because you had actual claims to make, and so rappers were very effective at doing this um, by using words to, to express their, um, um, their, their discomfort with the situation. Um, it started out with a bit of freestyling plus a lot of um, prepared songs that these uh, rappers and reggae artists actually performed, but you know, slowly but surely, they started to involve in things that involved more call and response exchange, like the incident that we um, saw earlier. So by 2012, when the purpose of these demonstrations tended to move away from 
letting people know that there was a problem to actually mobilizing the population to do something. Um, you know, by, by mid-2012, I would say most of the demonstration was really about the call and response pattern that was generated by the rapper uh, to the um, protesters uh, with, a, with a DJ spinning. So here's an example of um, what happens in uh, a demonstration in July 29, 2012 in Kasumigaseki. So, so we are now looking at this videotape from 2012 and 2016, and the emotional impact is a little bit different. Um, I happen to be at this demonstration, and this was one of the most exciting parts of the demonstration because that particular street had two very big concrete and glass buildings, and the sound was ricocheting between the two buildings, and everybody was, was really angry and really excited, and you could feel the heat. It was really hot. You could feel the heat of everybody else's body around you. Um, now, in 2016, watching this, here we're, you know, here we're seeing a bunch of really, really angry people yelling at this building, which is the symbol of um, the government, and the you know, building doesn't respond. It's kind of sitting there silently. So, so it becomes kind of a metaphor of the government's response to uh, the nuclear crisis. So you know, these videos actually end up being a protest of themselves. They take a life of their own after, um, after being filmed and being uploaded onto the internet. So now let me move on to festivals. Um, as many of you have, who have been to a festival know, they're kind of a space apart from one's usual life. And you can, they have a, their own immersive community for a short period of time. They're often marketed as lifestyle kinds of products. Um, and you can kind of try out different behaviors or different lifestyles that you probably wouldn't otherwise do for this very short period of time. It's kind of a safe space to take on new identities and discuss issues. So here's a picture of the NGO village at, um, at Fuji Rock Festival. Um, what I've noticed at music festivals as far as the anti-nuclear um, uh, issue is concerned is that there are two types of communication approaches. One I'm calling the informational, where arguments are presented. Or, and the other is what I'm calling experiential, which is more kind of an immersive sort of thing. So No Nukes, which is a series of festivals that um, Sakamoto has organized every year since 2012, I would say is more informational. So in the first um, uh, No Nukes 2012 concert, um, there were several different media that were relaying a particular message. You had a program book that had messages from the artists and various um, nuclear statistics. You had a guidebook which had a lot of interviews and essays with act, you know, bought, written by activists. Um, once you got into the concert hall, um, between sets they would play a video uh, with um, uh, featuring uh, Koide, uh, the anti-nuclear physicist. Uh, you have videos of Fukushima evacuees. And then afterward, after the uh, concert, you could actually go outside into this, uh, uh, in this concession hall where there were a whole bunch of uh, NGO booths set up, and you could actually talk to people there. They were often manned by younger people, and you could, you know, you could talk to them about the issues and perhaps even get involved. So, so that's kind of a, a more informational approach to running a political uh, music festival. Um, Otomo Yoshida's, um, Yoshida's Project Fukushima, on the other hand, I would say is more experiential. They do hold workshops mm -hmm. and other kinds of things like that, but I would say that um, more, than, more than that, there are actually situations where the political ideas 
are actually emitted through participatory practices. Um, this festival does not have an explicit anti-nuclear message, and uh, the organizers would say that quite strongly. Um, but a lot of what goes on in this festival, because it is in Fukushima City, um, does make you think about uh, the nuclear crisis. So one good example of that is the uh, Furoshiki that you see here, which was put down to keep radiation from sped spreading. It was supposed to keep you from absorbing the radiation that's in the grass, and it was supposed to keep you from spreading the radiation home after you got out of Fukushima. But of course, you know, it's really largely symbolic, and they're still using this um, in, the, in the festival. They certainly used it in 2015 when I last went. And, and so the experience of stepping on them reminds you that there is this radiation issue. And, so it's a w and it's also a way for people around the country who can't go to the festival to participate in it. So you often see um, pieces of cloth on this furoshiki with little messages mm. uh, to Fukushima from people who have sent them in. So it's a nice way to get people involved. And so you know, the Project Fukushima is all about involving the audience. And just because you're involved, you, you are made to think about what is going on. So, so finally, let me talk about recordings, which as you could imagine, um, being published products are the most uh, censored of the areas that we're talking about. And uh, censorship in Japan is not the government going through redacting things. That's not really what's happening. What's really happening is self-censorship. So um, as Jim Dorsey wrote, um, since the, since the mid-1950s, we've had this um, organization called The Recording, which is a, um, which is a, uh, a body uh, that is related to the Record Industry Association of Japan that inspects every single record that comes out. Um, in practice, what happens is that the management will stop anything that is poss possibly controversial from uh, getting to the record end because if something is caught by the record end, you're going to have to re-record the song, you're going to have to reprint the lyrics, you might even have to change the titles. It's just a pain and it's very expensive. So the record uh, company management will stop that. And even before that, you have a record company inspection department that will look at the record. But even before that, you have record producers that would uh, discourage artists, particularly young artists, from saying anything um, political. And this is something that um, affects all genres, not just the really, really commercial J-pop. Um, I mean, one extremely famous rapper told me about how some of his things had gotten redacted in ways that were pretty surprising to me because I didn't see how they disturbed the national or public order. So here are the rules that you're supposed to follow. You're not supposed to disturb the national public order. You're not supposed to say anything that would damage the honor of a nation, ethnicity, or organization. And um, de facto, um, companies are going to follow the stricter rules of the National Association of Commercial Broadcasters because if, you, if your song isn't broadcast, then it's not going to sell anyway. So you can't say anything that would disgrace the authority of government or its agencies or avoid interfering with or influencing of topics under national deliberation. So that severely limits the kind of political songs that you can write. Um, and in practice, what uh, record companies do is they'll avoid doing anything that, um, releasing anything that involves a proper noun of an actual existing person or organization. So, you know, imagine one of the best selling um, uh, protest songs in the US, Ohio by Neil Young, which starts out, Tin Soldiers and Nixon Coming. Um, probably wouldn't be released in Japan. Right. And moreover, everybody knows what will happen to you if you, if you release a song that you're not supposed to release. So um, um, I'm not going to play this for, for in the interest of time, but uh, essentially RC Succession and Kyoshiro was made a, a, an example over. So that whole incident discouraged pe other people from releasing um, anti nuclear songs. So what um, uh, artists will do is they'll use a combination of allegory, metaphor, or metonym if they want to put out something political at all. So you know we talked about Saito Kazuyoshi before, who put out a very explicitly anti-nuclear song over the internet. When he released an album later on in the year, he, he used a lot of allegories. So one of the allegories he uses is 
is based on Aesop's The Heron and the Tortoise. And um, what happens in this particular allegory is that the um, rabbit or the hare races against the tortoise four times and loses each time. And the video shows you what's, what's happening. So in the second verse, what happens is that you know, the, the hare is trying to cheat by taking a limo. Uh, here's, um, here's a purple roadrunner in a wanted sign. He takes this limo. Uh, it turns out that this um, person probably represents this, the nuclear village. He's talking about money. And at the end of the verse, he's entertaining all these people in the limo with women and money. And in the end, um, you know, he asks, which one was it that won in the end? And so what uh, Saito Kazuyoshi has said in um, interviews is that the point of his song is, why does Japan need to run so fast that it needs nuclear power to do so? Why do we have to be the number three economy? Why can't we just be happy with being the number 20 economy? Um, another way to allude to this situation is through metonyms. So um, as, we, as many of you know, um, shortly after the crisis, uh, the town of Minamisoma <clears throat> on the coast was devastated. And so the, um, the mayor did a YouTube video that asked for help. And this made Minamisoma a very famous city. And, and um, the, uh, the group Kururi and its members went up to Minamisoma, as did a lot of other artists, to try to help out. And so, you know, they developed a kind of attachment to the area. So on their 2012 album, um, entitled Rutsubo no Borutsu, um, they did a song called Soma, which is supposed to be an ode to all these towns that have been lost uh, through radiation and the nuclear crisis, where people can no longer feel comfortable or go back to their homes. And um, they never mention the word radiation or nuclear power, which are actually kind of taboo in the record industry. but it does make you think about these lost homelands by the tone of, of the singing voice, which almost sounds like a cry at various points, and the uh, evocation of this lost seaside homeland through the instrumentation, um, which I think you'll probably hear. Um, Asian Kung Fu generation is even more mysterious. Um, as many of you know, uh, Goto Masafumi has been very active in many social movements post 311, and he blogs quite explicitly about these issues. But in the music, he tends to avoid doing that. So he has this mysterious song called N2, and I had to go to a concert to figure out what that actually meant. N2 means no nukes. And the two also refers to you too, who have been very active um, campaigning against Sellafield, uh, the nuclear power plant um, in Britain. And, uh, and so it's a, it's a tribute to them as well. So the way he tri pays tribute to them is by quoting the introductory riff from Vertigo, which um, is one of the songs on how to dismantle an atomic bomb by U2. And it goes like this. So Asian Kung Fu Generation quotes this in a, a little bit off, but you know, quite recognizably in the bridge. And, um, and then they create a riff that is based on that particular riff that 
pervades through the entire song. And um, this particular riff is harmonically ambig ambiguous, and it's a circular pattern with no strong cadences, which gives this feeling of staticness and uncertainty. So the music itself is kind of a metaphor for what he's talking about, which is entrapment and the inability to change or escape. So in the, in the lyrics, Gotch is urging people not to trust official statements, as you can see in the lyrics. And um, he's quoting Tepco's mantra, it's safe and not to worry. And he likens what Tepco says to a dream, a spell, and then finally a delusion, at which point uh, his vocal line is extending upward as if to escape over the wall. And so you know, this is a case where the lyrics are actually quite mysterious, you know, but the music is actually kind of telling you what the point is supposed to be. So what is the legacy of the anti-nuclear movement when Abe is restarting nuclear power plants? And activists have shifted to protesting the secret protection law or the security law or the changing of the constitution. Well, I would say that a lot of the protesting methods of the anti-nuclear movement have continued into these, these um, other kinds of protests. So the youth group SEALs, for example, uses this wrapped call and response pattern um, and the music that they use is different, but a lot of the calls are reminiscent of the call and response patterns that existed for the anti-nuclear movement. Okay, so thank you very much, and thanks to all these uh, people and organizations. Everyone, if you could please come up to the microphone to speak. Um, and also note that we are recording this. Yeah? So thank you very much for uh, your lecture. But I have a question then. Mm -hmm. What what the response of the from the government against this musician? Is there any anything that government say to the to the musician such as like uh uh well nuclear is still safe, so you don't need to say that kind of things. Is there anything government? No, no, no. There's uh, uh, first of all, there's very little explicit that musicians, you know, particularly those with good marketing, great marketing power, are actually saying. I mean, the, a lot of it is hidden in allegories and metaphors and metonyms that they're commercially released. Mm -hmm. um, and there is this, you know, there is a a law for freedom of speech, so the government wouldn't really be in a great position. Mm -hmm. Say stuff like that, but no, I I do not know of any. 
government moves to, to silence musicians. I think it's really done more at the media industry level, where people just realize that it would not be cool. Thank you very much. Oh, hi, uh, thank you for your talk. Um, I'm Miyumi Hashimoto. I'm an intern at TUJ, mm -hmm. and I work with Kyle. And I have two questions. Um, okay. One is that um, the protest music, although like the people who are doing the music, like say like demonstrators, they're having fun. They're like enjoying. I can see that they're like portraying the message to each other. But does it? help to convey the message to other people who are not in the demonstration by especially using music because like the reactions that I've seen around me like in Tokyo like when the demonstrations like music is going on it's like they're like urusai like it's noisy it's meiwaku it's like yeah. causing trouble to others so is it like helping or I feel like it could sometimes damage themselves because they're being noisy and stuff like and my second question is about the No Nukes Festival that you mentioned. Mm -hmm. um, like, I've heard about it, and I heard that they stopped doing it, like, last year. Uh, it was that the last one was last year, and they're not doing it this year. So do you think there was, like, any, like, I guess, something pressure, or, like, why, why do you think that was? Yeah, thank you. Yeah, I haven't, I haven't heard that about uh, No Nukes 2016. Um, no Nukes 2015 took place, um, even though Sakamoto um, hasn't necessarily been all that well, and uh, No Nukes 2014 also took place. So um, that, that would be news to me. Um, I would imagine that um, at, you know, at this point they probably, well, what you find in, for example, Atomic Cafe, um, at, at uh, the Fuji Rock Festival, um, it was revived in 2011 um, specifically to address the nuclear issue, but over 2014 and 2015, they really started to address other kinds of issues because you know, they, people were starting to tire of hearing about um, the nuclear issue. And so there might be a similar dynamic uh, with holding a very specific no news kinds of, of concert. Um, and then going back to your other question about whether or not music helps or hinders um, a demonstration, I think there are, there are a couple of different things, but uh, people have had very differing philosophies about whether or not you should have music in a demonstration. And um, certainly in the early stages of the movement in 2011, um, a lot of these... Um, big demonstrations were being organized by Shiroto Naram, which is a, um, um, uh, an activist group in, in Koenji. And um, they, were, you know, they were quite carnivalesque. People would dress up in clown costumes or, or other kinds of costumes, and they would be dancing, and there would be um, lots and lots of trucks with different kinds of music. There would be a, a punk truck. You know, there would be a, you know, a hip-hop and dance music truck, there might even be another uh, DJ truck, and there were, there were a lot of musics, and I think, I think in 2011, that was probably okay, because you needed to get people out to the demonstration, and this made it fun and more approachable to go. Um, I mean, frankly, it could be very intimidating and, and you know, intimidating to go to um, uh, demonstrations, because there's, there's a fairly heavy police presence at many of them, and that could be quite intimidating. So I think they served a certain purpose at that time. But um, there was one uh, demonstration by Shorto Rand in September of 2011 where 13 people got arrested. And as you know, uh, getting an arrest, being arrested in Japan is much serious business because you could be held for 23 days without an indictment, as Larry Rapetta can tell you. And um, you know, the average stay if you're arrested at a, a demonstration is usually 10 days, and you can't call anybody besides your lawyer, so you could easily lose your job and ruin your career. So you know, it's quite scary to do that. So after that particular incident happened, uh, Shirota and Aram really retrenched. And um, a new uh, philosophy started to develop to say we should have a more kind of stoic kind of demonstration. 
So people started to rally more toward the Twitno nukes model of a very stoic, drums only, chants only kind of demonstration. So people have had differing ideas mm -hmm. about demonstrations. Uh, I would say that music tends to attract attention in, in a way that a, a stoic demonstration often doesn't. And um, you can certainly hear uh, a music demonstration much, much further out than you can hear a, a drums only per, um, demonstration. So there are pluses and minuses that I think get involved. Um, thank you for your talk. Um, you said about that music is very difficult to express the like, anti empathy but I think in <coughs> movies there are a lot of documentary movies which expresses Hang Empatsu or about the earthquake. Mm. Why do you think there is a really different music in movies about expressing your thoughts? I think it has to do with dependence on the advertising industry and television for exposure. So, so many of the documentaries that you're talking about, I don't think really make money, and they go through independent uh, movie theaters. They don't go through the big chains. They don't receive much in terms of advertising, particularly on television. Um, whereas, you know, as I as I showed, um, the biggest form of exposure for most major label musicians is is television. So you can't really alienate these people. I mean, the most famous uh, example of an entertainer who got really, you know, slammed for being anti-nuclear is Yamamoto Taro. Right? You know, he he joins the demonstration and tweets about it, and then he makes this video for um, uh, Operation Kodomo Tachi, which was an NGO that was organized by by the Rapid Delhi. Um, you know, after that happened, he was essentially made to quit by his agency, and then he became an unemployable actor. He was fired from his job and everything. So. It's, it's, it can be difficult if you need major media outlets like television. Yeah. Um, I, came, I came up with a second question, is that uh, you said that uh, there's a no government response to the musician. So I thought that this anti-nuclear music was to to tell the government that we should abol abolish the nuclear. But it, when I heard that there's no response, it sounded to me that, so what is the point of this music? It sounds like, it's because if the government doesn't do anything, <laughs> that is, is the people just keep protesting just for something? Or is it just... Well, yeah, well, that raises the question of what is the purpose of a social movement? You know, because many social movements fail. And, um, you know, but one has social movements that occur periodically because the people or, or groups of people feel that their point is not being heard or their position is not being taken seriously. So, so then you have a social movement. And, um, musics like this, you know, serve a couple of different functions which may or may not have been intended by the original artist. Um, the, the, the first is just to raise awareness or, or um, ride or you know, basically resonate with the, with the way people are feeling like the first song I play. Um, you can have educational purposes where people say what is actually going on through the song. Um, or you can mobilize people through the song by getting people excited so that they're chanting and, and saying the words, I don't want any nuclear power by themselves, and therefore internalizing it. Um, they can also help to build solidarity if you're actually doing an activity together. Um, yeah, so there, there are lots of different functions that these musics actually have. Um, if a musician is famous, they'll often attract people to a demonstration. You know, so there's that impact as well. Like uh, social contribution. Yeah. Things. Nice. Thank you very much. Um, just kind of leading off of that, mm -hmm. so a lot of the songs you were saying have 
allegory and they use allegory in order to protest the nuclear yeah. uh, situation. Um, how easy is it for the general listener to pick up on those allegories? Well, I think the 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 one by um, Saito Kazuyoshi was probably explicit enough to be pretty easily picked up. Okay, yeah, yeah. that one. But the uh, yeah. the Asian Kung Fu Generation music that you were saying that you would have had to be a fan of Asian Kung Fu Generation and read a lot of Gotcha's blogs to figure out gotcha. what that song was really about because he doesn't even say so directly in the blog itself. Right. Um, um, I mean the the lyrics are certainly guessable, mm -hmm. right? You know, this idea of search and doubt. Search meaning search on the internet and don't believe everything that's on TV. That could be certainly figured out in rain falling, you know, black rain perhaps. And so, so you can figure these things out. And certainly at the time that songs like this came out in 2012, this would have been in the minds of a lot of people. And just one more question. Um, what would be maybe the highest level of protest music, um, like how high would it go up, maybe kind of like a fame ladder? So like I know Asian Kung Fu Generation, they're pretty, um, pretty famous, famous, right? Um, how, how far has it gone up? Like, has it hit major, other major artists or, you know, even if the lyrics are really secretive? Well, you know, well, Sakamoto, I don't think, has written uh, explicitly anti nuclear well, actually, that's not true, he has. Um, but he would be a pretty famous person. That but he releases that kind of music usually on SoundCloud. Yeah. Yeah. But they, but basically genres like hip hop, which tend not to be major label, tend to be a lot more active in something like this. Yeah. Yes, uh, <clears throat> congratulations on your fabulous book. Thank you. Um, I have a few questions, uh, particularly probing um, what you said about how lyrics have gone to, to more allegorical and metaphorical uh, realms mm -hmm. as the years go by. And you know, I'm thinking of parallels with what happened in the 60s, so that's mm, sort of okay. where the questions are coming to, you know, coming from. Uh, one is, I wonder if there's any, if there's any concern or any um, consciousness in the protest, uh, post-Fukushima protest music, about um, their music being a kind of propaganda of its own. Um, it's on oh, the yeah. other side of the ideological spectrum, yeah. but it's a kind of propaganda of its own, and um, particularly in a kind of uh, demonstration, chant, and response sort of thing. Lots of the subtleties of the issues aren't addressed. It's just, yeah. you can't do it. I wonder if there was any uh, concern about that, and might that have been one of the inspirations for moving to more poetic, literary, allegorical ways as a kind of consciousness raising rather than straight anti-nuke propaganda? That's question one. Second, how about uh, concerns over what happens with a kind of crowd mentality, which can be a very dangerous thing, um, and whether there's uh, any expression, uh, if you've heard any voices of concern about that. And then finally, with a move towards more um, poetic or allegorical expressions, in order to remain somewhat commercially viable, does this mean we get a split with musicians who are amateurs or non-commercial going sort of more radical? Or do, does, do the, mess, the kinds of messages sent split because of that divide? Okay. Let me, uh, let me first address your second question. I, I, I think that's true. I think you are seeing this sort of split between um, major label and non-major label. In, in terms of behavior. So just to give you an example, um, I, I met Ranking Taxi for the first time in 2008, and one of the points he made to me was that reggae in Japan tends to miss the kind of political aspects of reggae, and he claimed that he had written some you know, political songs, like the Sandy Nuker song, which was originally written in 1989, but the, you know, but the uh, reaction to it wasn't all that good, so he, ten, you know, he did, tended not to go out of his way to write one. But his latest album, which came out in 2015, is, is you know, almost wholly political. Yeah. It's about the recent things about, you know, about, you know, what Abe is, about Abe's policies, and it's also about the nuclear issue. No, it's, it's, he's, he's doing it from an independent label. So, you know, they have a little bit more freedom to do what they want to do. 
Um, and then, yeah, on, on the other hand, you know, Saito Kazuyoshi, I don't think, has released a political song really since 2011. And if he has, it's very, very subtle. So I, I think you do have this, this, this kind of split. And then um, in terms of, of this non-propagandistic approach to composition, certainly Otomo Yoshida would be one of the kinds of people who really tries to eschew having explicit politics in his music or his activities. I mean, there, you know, obviously what he does is very politically tinged and he has opinions, but you know, he doesn't actually want to imbue his music necessarily in an explicit way with it. You know, he, you know, to him, I, I think it probably seemed a little bit too facile. You know? and, and you see a lot of that with Kuduri too, because you know, that particular album in 2012, a number of songs are quite explicitly you know, anti-nuclear and political, but they do it in this way that is actually quite interesting and, and artful. So. Yeah, I know it exists. Um, I've tended to hear that more from the other side than, you know, from from the, the people that I've been most working with. But, uh, you know, people, people do talk about it, but I can't really think of a, a good example of how people c counteract that. Yeah? First of all, thank you so much, Noriko, for gathering all this information and documenting it for us. And I can't wait to see it. I'm sure it's fabulous. Thank you. Um, just regarding crowd mentality, so I, I've been studying Japanese constitutional law for a while, and um, you know, demonstrations in Japan must be the most peaceful demonstrations in the whole world. In Europe and in, in, in Western countries, we get we get violence, and you could, and, and you did in Japan in the in the, 60s. In the 70s, yeah, you know, 60s, 70s during the Vietnam War, you know, that uh, professor. Japanese professor of law, I know, has said that Japan may be the most over-policed country in the world. Mm. And there's a massive police presence in Japan. And uh, as you pointed out, when there are street demonstrations, the police are out in force. And often with a smaller demonstration, the number of police is greater than the number of demonstrators. It looks, it looks like a police demonstration, yeah. And, <laughs> and in, in, um, in, as some of your photos showed that, that for example, if you see a demonstration in Tokyo, um, whereas if you saw it in New York or anywhere in, in Europe, you, know, you would have people covering the entire street. Yeah. And in the United States, the, the, the marching permit would have the police block off traffic so the marchers could march down the middle of the street. Yeah. Here, the marchers get one lane. And the traffic is not blocked. And the marchers are required to stop at the traffic signal. So the parade is broken up into small, bite-sized bits. It's, uh, you know, the, the, big, the big demonstrations that you might see coming out of Hibiya Park and going up to the Diet, or I live in the Omote Sando area, and there are very often demonstrations down Aoyama Boulevard, yeah. but they're limited to one lane. And everybody has to stop at the traffic signals, and there's a police yeah. man in, in uniform, you know, blocking people at the... Mm -hmm. Um, but anyway, I wanted to say a couple of things. Just very quickly, are you aware, uh, have there been any flash mobs in Japan? Is anyone aware? You've seen flash mobs in Japan? I'm yes? Sure they have I, I have. In Shibuya, you've seen it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, the flash mobs, in my I've never participated, but they're generally anonymous. You know, planned to be. Oh, I see. By the group anonymous. I think probably in the United States, the best known are related to um, climate change, right? So, mm -hmm. getting 350 people because a red line should be 350 parts per million of CO2 and mm -hmm. so forth. Um, but anyway, I wanted to tell you—you you might not know this—I um, 
the United Nations Special Rapporteur on Freedom of Expression was in Japan in April. Mm -hmm. um, and you may not know about you know, who this person is, and that the United Nations, Japan is a member of many human rights treaties, and of course freedom of expression is one of the cardinal values. And you know, music is obviously an example of expression. And in your presentation, you explained sort of the censorship process. Yeah. The self-censorship. Self and so that we get the question of uh, what is the government? What is the government doing to restrict this? And the answer is, well, directly nothing, yeah. because the industry itself conducts the censorship. And your my slide explained how that happens. Um, and the, anyway, the the UN Special Rapporteur is right now. It's an American law professor who's appointed by the United States Human Rights Council. He visits countries around the world, and he came to Japan to, for one week. In the fact finding tour, and he needs your book. Um, <laughs> so you can, I've never seen this explained. You know, that this process in the Japanese entertainment industry, yeah. where it's a taboo for any Japanese entertainer to make a political statement yeah. that may be contrary to the government position. And, but you explain that in the music industry. And he needs that because he's preparing his final report to the United Nations. Oh, uh, and it, he's got a he's got a temporary report that came out. And among he was focused largely on the news industry, and so he he wrote that if anyone's aware of the Japanese news business, you may know about the so-called reporters clubs, the Kisha Club. He said they should be disbanded because they're a mechanism really for controlling you know, news reporting, having the government you know, indirectly control news. But anyway, he needs that information, so we need to get him a copy of it. Okay, I will. Uh, I will ask the publisher. <laughs> Thank you so much. Um, is he in New York? He's uh, he's in Los Angeles. He teaches at UC Irvine. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Well, I'm so thrilled to learn more about um, what you've been doing recently. Um, I haven't been able to come to Japan for a couple of years, so it's great to hear um, everything that you've been collecting and analyzing, and it's so inspiring. And I'm obviously going to get your book. <laughs> um, and um, but I'm 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 sort of in in relation to some of the questions about music being the only um, industry that's self-centered, uh, self-censored. Oh, um, I, I think other places it, are self-censored too. Yeah, it yeah. seems like um, I, I do a lot of work in media and film, yeah. and I think the state secret law had a huge um, mm -hmm. sort of impact on especially independent filmmakers who um, felt very uh, threatened um, by the... Um, by the possibility of being um, arrested mm. for investigating. Um, and so I think it's dampened a lot of independent media that we normally think of as being independent um, and mm. not at all. But I'm, I'm really curious, um, so that's just a comment, but I'm really curious about, you mentioned that you had come to Japan first to um, look at um, Kind of to, to follow Japanese rap, um, well, club music, club yeah. music, yeah. and um, and it seems like um, when I was covering some of the demonstrations and protests in two thousand and four, um, it seems like many of the same um, people from the club music world were um, active, and those same people like Rankin Taxi and ECD are. Um, and Shiro Tonoran were still um, the same kind of uh, are, are still sort of the the same generators of a lot of the kind of political music that's um, been happening. And I'm mm. wondering if you've noticed any kind of changing configurations at all since um, maybe 2004 or 
2011. Um, a lot of the people are similar. I mean, a, a lot of the people who organized the Against Street Control in 2004 have dropped out and have been, you know, quite absent from some of the post-2011 uh, kinds of materials, although, although, you know, there are a few people. And then a number of the people who were involved in the Shibaki Tai or the, um, or the Hangen Ren were um, actually not organizers, but they were participants in a lot of the against street control related demonstrations. So there is kind of a line of lineage, um, which is not surprising given that it's so um, intimidating to go to a demonstration for most people that you would have had to had some sort of con human contact with it before to be participating probably. And is there um, still the same kind of... Um, like in 2004, there was um, maybe the internet was being used in different ways. So yeah. it was being used to kind of um, invite people to demonstrations. But there was also a, a, a real um, kind of uh, link connection between club culture and street protests where the same songs would be um, kind of played in the streets and then um, they'd ECD would play a concert in a club, and there would be um, all of those kind of people in um, clubs would then go out into the streets, and I think yes. there was a really kind of symbiotic relationship. And I'm wondering with um, the sort of um, development of the internet, if that kind of symbiotic relationship has transformed to be more kind of internet heavy, or do you still see that kind of... Um, Club culture playing a pivotal role? Or? Well, as you, as you probably know, club culture has taken a real dive since about 2010 because of the Fueho. And, and so a lot of the major clubs in Osaka in particular were closed in 2011, 2012. And then a number of clubs in, Tokyo, in the Tokyo area and uh, other cities were closed. So uh, club culture is just starting to recover after the revision to entertainment law, but it's not still where it was in, say, 2008 or 2009. So, um, so you don't have the same kind of loop. And I think the other thing that you've um, found is that, is that um, the people who are going to the clubs seem to be getting older. But... Um, but you, and, and the young people are not participating as much, which is probably why you still have the prominence of a lot of these people who were active in 2004 um, still being prominent today. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that's also why people are so fascinated by the SEALs phenomenon, because certainly in 2011, 2012, and part of 2013, you rarely saw college <coughs> students at a demonstration. Um, at the university where I was, you know, I had a position while I was on sabbatical, um, there was a rumor going around that if you as a student were photographed once at a demonstration, then you would never get a job in the government. And given that, you know, 2012 was a really bad economic time, even getting a job in the post office was really coveted, and so they didn't want to go out to demonstrations. So you, you have that phenomenon. And, and so the SEALs thing, I think, is, has been really exciting because of that. But even so, you know, from what I understand from other people that I've spoken with, most students are still not really participating in demonstrations. Even though you, you now at least have some infusion of young blood, so to speak, into them. Does that answer your question? One more question. Yeah. Um, um, I guess in terms of political process and mm -hmm. um, there seemed to be a real divide among um, uh, a certain larger mainstream group like Twit No Nukes um, who wanted to um, create a more effective and widespread and mainstream um, form of kind of family oriented protest and um, those who were more interested in concentrating on process itself rather than the end, um, the kind of end, mm -hmm. end or the me we're concentrating more on the means than the ends. And I'm wondering if that has kind of, um, you seem to allude to it in 
um, maybe a lot of what you've talked to uh, talked about today, but also in other talks that I've heard you give. And I'm um, wondering how that's playing out now. I, I was just thinking because the elections are coming up, and yeah. um, um, there's a yeah. um, there's people like Miyake Yohei who are trying to really inspire um, young people to go out and vote and really be part of a um, part of a a kind of official politics and an mm -hmm. official political um, process. Um, and many of the demonstrations seem to be, um, at least early on, much more focused on a, um, creating a more um, kind of local politics that people could feel like they were participating in and investing in, but it wasn't necessarily to generate an ends uh, or to... Yeah to influence official politics? Well, I would imagine that's kind of a, that seems like a logical way for things to go at this point because the fear at this point for, you know, for, for the leftists would be that um, the LDP would win its two-thirds majority and therefore, you know, all these processes, or all these um, policies would actually be implemented like the changing of the Constitution. And, um, and you also have to, one also has to remember that a lot of the things that people have protested against, like nuclear power or the secret law or the security law and so on and so forth, have essentially gone the other way and all these laws have been ratified and nuclear power plants have been restarted. So, and, and it's quite difficult you know, for social movements to keep going with that kind of discouragement. So it would make a lot of sense to me to refocus on that kind of process of engaging with local politics and and trying to get people to vote. But, uh, but um, you did see a little bit of that in 2013 during the election, but it wasn't necessarily successful given the numbers that came in. Yes? Uh, some references have been made to the 60s. And uh, I was a student in the 60s. I once took part in a demonstration against the revision of the Japan US Security Treaty. But later I joined the government. Oh? Uh, the number of people like me who did take part in these demonstrations, but then subsequently joined the government. Yeah. That's, uh, that's a statement. Okay. My question is, could there possibly, uh, do, you, do you see any possibility of the mainstreaming of some of these protest movements? By that I mean a sort of uh, situation in which uh, uh, Pete Seeger sings and yes. uh, is joined by Barack Obama. Yes. I saw yesterday uh, a YouTube version of uh, This Land is Your Land being sung uh, as a part of the campaign by Bernie Sanders. If, do you think it's, it's possible in Japan? If, if it is not, why not? To have a mainstreaming of... Uh, to have a mainstreaming of social movements, you mean? Protest, uh, protest music. Of protest music. What is mainstream? Because what I think of mainstream, because I'm thinking about this in terms of the music business, I'm thinking of AKB48 and, <laughs> and, and the idols, and it would be... Yeah, and it would be it would be very difficult for me to picture AKB48 doing anything even remotely like oh. that. So um, um, perhaps I should rephrase my question. Okay. My feeling is that uh, the kind of protest music that you refer to has failed to achieve the resonance that that it requires in society. Yeah. Not not as much as. Uh, uh, folk songs or blues, for that matter, or rock and roll uh, has achieved in American society or in the British, in British society. And I keep wondering why. Uh, yeah, part of that would be the atomization of taste that you've actually had in the music industry. Uh, the atomization of taste, um, which is something you actually see in amongst Japanese youth as, as well. Um, a lot of the... Uh, under 18 said in Japan, for example, would get their um, musical taste shaped by social networks or through the internet like YouTube, and it's kind of hard to um, 
to control what people actually see and like as you can with a very television-centric or mainstream radio-centric world as we had in the 1960s and 70s where you know, a particular um, artist or a particular album could sell several million copies. It's very difficult to get that these days. So I think that is part of what you're also seeing is the atomization of musical taste. Um, that's something that uh, Shiroto Naran and other political um, activists have worried about because there, there was a big debate as to whether or not you should have a punk chart because you know, you know, you had all these guys and you know, with long hair and leather and fake blood, and they were scaring the mothers away. And 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 so, you know, they the Shiroto Naran actually had a meeting to discuss that, and they decided that you know they wanted to be pluralistic and they wanted everybody to express themselves in the way they do, and so on and so forth. But you do get that kind of impact. You know, if people don't like the genres, they won't like the message. So sometimes what you find is that people will go to a genre that they assume everybody knows, like ondo. So there are several anti-nuclear ondo. You know, so there's the monjukun ondo, or the genpatsu gakkari ondo by Ranking Taxi, or the, um, what was the other ondo? Oh, um, Otomo Yoshihide wrote uh, an ondo for the, for the 2013 version of, of Project Fukushima which went over quite well, and he snuck in a very vaguely worded political verse in there, which sometimes they omit in live performance, but all the others were actually contributed by various people in, in Project Fukushima, and so people react to that because Ondo is supposed to be something that everybody knows and everybody has danced to before. So that would be an example of something that works. I mean, it's not gonna be a huge, you know, top 10 hit or anything, you know, certainly not in the days of AKB48, which take up the top 10 spots, but um, it'll be something that people listen to and enjoy. Luca, thank you so much. Really appreciate your time and very interesting lecture. Um, if I could make a quick announcement, uh, the ICASR Institute is a nonprofit organization, but we do incur some Cough, so if you're feeling generous, there's a donation box on the way out. Um, we'd also like to have your Meishi if, if you'd like to join our mailing list. We do about 30 to 40 events a year, and um, although we'll be away in August, we have quite a number of events coming up in September and October. So thanks for coming out. Thanks again.